So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. And um, Harry Giles is a designer, engineer, educator, specializing in buildings, materials, and structures within a framework of sustainable design. He has over 29 years of combined experience as a principal in many international com uh, competition and award-winning commissions uh, at Ovarup and Borough Happold Engineers, working with reputable architects such as Norman Foster, Wilkinson Iyer, and uh, Frederick Fisher. In his work, his approach is always interdisciplinary, integrating holistic design approaches and building on his multi, uh, multidisciplinary experience at Arup Associates. He is a professor of practice of architecture at the Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. He operates an independent consultancy, HG Design, in building design and technology. And he, uh, he was the inventor of the Setumbra uh, window facade system and founder of Setumbra LLC. He has a background as a structural engineer with over 30 years of experience in architecture and building construction, and his experience and knowledge of building technology informs product development and growth. He is the company president and directs product development. He was a natural choice for a week in which we are celebrating entrepreneurship, integration, collaboration, and sustainability within the context of STEM, science, technology, education, art, and architecture. So without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Harry Giles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I tend to speak quite loudly, so I might get rid of this thing eventually. I have not used to this hall. So let's see how interdisciplinary we are here tonight. How many engineers and architects? Engineers, put up your hands. Architects. Yay. <laughs> so in a way, this is what defines the difference between engineers and architects, those who stay on after five. In practice, it's like that as well. OK, <clears throat> so uh, to kick off here, I'm going to show you a few slides, which you should read, which are mandatory. But you have to read real fast, because I'm not going to put them up there for very long. Okay, so it's supposed to be some learning objectives, um, and I'm going to go through a series of discussion areas that um, touch on these. Um, I'm going to talk about innovation turning points, uh, building practice, research through making, integrated design systems, holistic and sustainable design, leveraging industrial technologies, technology transfer, and product development and commercialization. So in that order, um, I've, I've arranged uh, to talk about these subject areas under those sort of thematic headings. So what you'll see is a bit of a jumping around between projects that are going to re reoccur. So I'm not going to talk about projects specifically and then move on to the next project. It's going to be a bit of a mix and match where I'll try and um, highlight the specifics uh, around each of the slides that I'm going to put up. <coughs> Okay, so these, this is our, our headings we're going to cover, and uh, we're going to start here with uh, innovation turning points. Um, so I want to talk about uh, something that Wachsmann wrote about in the 1960s um, in a book about the turning point of building. And he showed how emerging technologies since the 19th century contributed to decisive influences as a turning point in architecture at the time. And he showed how only industry can determine what can be achieved by establishing what he called boundaries or the possible. Um, so to sort of highlight that here, um, what, what are the prerequisites for a, a, a good building? Um, and it could boil, be boiled down to talking about the best tools and the be best methods that you would have available. And industrialization uh, certainly does achieve this. It provides technical accuracy, uh, quality, and precision. So what this now converts to is that industry, not the craftsman, determines what can be achieved. This is what is defining the boundary and where one can push that boundary. 
So a uh, simple way of thinking about it is the relationship between uh, the machine and the product as opposed to a hand tool and the object that's being shaped. So the machine and product is the factory-based system, uh, which is essentially a standardized system uh, where you would create a mold and a template that becomes the original object. And then from there, the um, products that you make are copies of that original product. As opposed to uh, working with the hand and the tool in, in a workshop situation where the um, original and the copy is the same thing. And this really is what distinguishes between um, industrialized approaches and um, completely customized approaches. And the building industry has been caught in the um, customized approach uh, for, for centuries. Okay, it, it, it goes back to the beginning of time and it's still pretty much uh, caught in that mold. And uh, we've seen, you know, for example, the evolution of cars and aircraft and so on. The amazing advances that have happened in the last century has just left building standing still. So uh, if we talk about turning points defining the next wave of advancement, um, <coughs> these are some of the buildings that um, Wachsman referred to in his uh, discussion on the turning points of building. And, and uh, I, I guess you could find a lot of other equivalent buildings. These are not the only ones. But they, uh, they do provide a, a kind of reference point um, for, for what different achievements, uh, such as the Crystal Palace, uh, you know, the biggest, fastest steel frame building that just set its trends, um, which, which in fact are even hard to, to match today. Uh, the first development of skyscrapers, um, the, the next big step in, in bridge construction, um, uh, even the bicycle frame uh, was, was a huge innovation at its time uh, in the 1900s. And um, obviously the Eiffel Tower, again, um, this, this heroic uh, endeavor um, to, to work in steel to show what could be pushed in terms of this new material. And um, the story about the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, which went through two generations of, of, of designers um, and eventually was, was built, and uh, airship construction, which uh, really began to become the first sort of mass transit um, ability that, that, um, that we had. So um, Buxman himself um, tried to pioneer some of these moves um, through um, using very, very clever uh, connect connection details uh, expanded on a modular basis into a, a large space frame type of construction. Um, unfortunately, none of, the, none of these really got built, uh, but nonetheless, he did set a trend of, uh, at the time. Um, a, a, a contemporary of his, uh, Le Ricolet, um, also around about the early 20th century, talked about producing a continuum that brings together matter materials, construction systems, structural configuration, space, and place. Um, and what he was saying here was that all materials receive their isotropy from the directionality of their process in production. So there's, there's always a kind of systematic directionality to thinking about uh, process. Um, and, and, and in fact, you, you find this in nature as well as in human artifacts. And all equipment and processes have preferred direction of use, which gives directionality to the products. Um, and this applies to basic materials, uh, fabricated substances, and completed, completed buildings. So as the pace of um, industrial expansion uh, continues to accelerate exponentially, um, the imperatives for understanding today's role in a modern world are even more pressing and indeed uh, more daunting than they were during the first uh, half of, the, of this last century. And we see here, um, th this was my attempt at uh, saying, well, uh, at, 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 a, at around this time of the early to mid 70s, what could we define as a, a new turning point in building? And, and these iconic, um, well, some of them are iconic buildings, um, uh, have a meaning in a different way. Um, the, the, the sort of pioneering work that Frey Otto did with his uh, cable net systems, um, the Sydney Opera House, uh, which was really the very first sort of high-tech building of its time, uh, which used uh, computer systems to do the analysis. And, and um, a lot of the development work that Arab did at the time was really based on 
what, what sprang out of the innovations uh, that came out of the Sydney Opera House, uh, which in fact literally led into the Centre Pompidou. Um, same engineers worked on both those projects, so they were, they were really blazing a trail uh, in technology. Um, and endeavours in industrialised uh, construction, the capsule building in, in Tokyo, and the Willis Faber building, um, again, one of the first buildings that really opened up its skin to the light, um, the first planar uh, structural glazing system in the world. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the great rush to build ever and ever taller buildings, and uh, Sears Tower being one of the seminal buildings in that, in that regard. So, um, if we talk about the integration and leveraging of industrial derived technology across multiple disciplines, and, and here we see, um, you know, a lot of these were very engineeringly pioneered, um, certainly the Opera House and, and the Olympic Stadium. The uh, Centre Pompidou was, uh, was a great example of this integration of technology and design, uh, integration of architecture and technology. Uh, to the point where the technology was put on display as the architecture. And, and that was really a, a, a seminal uh, product of its time. Um, so just as uh, Wachsmann and Ricolet questioned proposed various paradigms for engaging with new technology in buildings, a question on the effectiveness of our current practice um, in integrating these new technologies um, pedagogically is also raised. So you'll see I'm going to talk a little bit about how we... Um, in fact, made discoveries through, through making, working with students, working through research, and how that can also um, influence this, this boundary. Um, so what are the new boundaries of the possible? Uh, where has there truly been success in this new and breathtakingly vast technology landscape of the future? So today, uh, where are we? Where are we now? 2000 onwards, what's going to happen in the next 50 years? And um, I think it would be true to say that this next turning point is already being defined um, through technology, the digital age, smart systems. Um, we see some illustrations there of, um, on the top left, um, people making endeavors now to uh, customize, mass customize um, organic form uh, in a way that was never ever possible until di digital technologies. Uh, began to make the conceptualization possible, and now the means of manufacture are also beginning to synchronize with that. Um, the, the middle illustration here, I, I put that up there because it, it, kind of, um, it kind of sums up for me um, something that's been going on for, a, for a, a number of decades, but it's now really come to a head. It's really come to such a, a poignant um, point of awareness um, in the context of, for example, green, we talk about green buildings, um, the, the uh, uh, looking at and, and focusing on um, the environmental systems integrated with the technological skin, um, the construction methodology, uh, how the building is run, um, how do you predict these uh, performances and so on. Um, so, and, and then once you link those predictions with uh, monitoring and control through sensor technology, um, all of a sudden, we're in a whole new ball game. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is move on to um, talk a little bit about some of the work I did um, in the last, uh, well, pre pre 2000, shall we say, uh, between 1990 and 2000, and then beginning to, to to also touch in with some of the latter projects later on, just to give you a bit of perspective and background on, on some of the things that, that I've been involved in and, and uh, through these examples, just to highlight one or two areas that um, I think are interesting in terms of how these uh, projects were conceived and what was innovative about uh, a component of that building. So this, uh, this is a um, relatively low-rise building in an industrial uh, office park. Uh, in the UK. And um, the best way to think of this is um, a building within a building. So the square that you see over here, um, that is the external envelope that you see there. The whole thing is completely glass, completely clear. Um, and then within that is this sort of slightly cruciform shaped building. 
um, which has its own facade, okay? So that's this facade that you see in here. Now you might think, well, you know, that, that seems a bit wasteful. You're building these two buildings. Uh, why don't you just build one building and one, one, one facade? Well, by detaching the inner from the outer facade, there were a lot of things began to happen. One is the um, outer facade begins to create a tempered zone in these, um, in these interstitial spaces between the, uh, the envelope and the, uh, the, building, uh, the building skin itself. And so if you think of, I'm sure you've all studied atria buildings and you've got this middle space and then the offices around it, this sort of inverted that concept. It said put the atrium on the outside of the building and, um, and give everybody an equal opportunity to uh, natural light. So if you imagine if you're on the floor space here, you've now got um, you know, 270 degrees of uh, vista and, and daylighting um, being penetrated into the building. So that actually turned out to be a very efficient floor plan. Um, furthermore, um, this tempered zone also provided a space that you could use on days of inclement weather, um, but not fully conditioned. Um, not, not, not fully conditioned in the sense of, um, in fact, having any mechanical uh, type of uh, conditioning in that external space. So it acts as a kind of um, a rain screen, uh, a windbreak, and uh, the, the, the bottom of the, of, the, of the facade can be opened up so that you could also naturally ventilate the building. And so if you're sitting in your office with all your papers and everything stacked up and you open the window, you don't have all the papers blowing away because the wind is blowing. So it, it acts as a kind of buffer, but the pressures build up sufficiently within that space that you actually do get cross ventilation through the building. Um, so there were a lot of uh, little things like that that um, I thought were um, you know, great innovations uh, of its time in, in conceiving this building. Um, another one, uh, this is right in the heart of London. Um, it was conceived of as a commercial office space. And uh, again, this, well, this one had a central atrium. And when the uh, developer uh, got a, an, an interested tenant, they said, well, we want a building that's got a dealer floor in it. And um, the ground floor of this building, which sits underneath the atrium, uh, this is the atrium uh, on top of the building, and so this is completely uh, clear and open on the center. And this is a, a large um, solar shade um, that hangs off the roof of the building uh, with a, a complete perimeter clear story over here. So there's a uh, tremendously good um, natural daylight filters down into that space. And they said, well, we'll take the building provided we can convert the atrium into a dealer floor. So this turned out to be the largest dealer floor um, in Europe at the time. Um, and so, you know, what, what more fitting can you think of these, you know, these banking spaces being the, the, you know, the new cathedrals of our time. Um, here the dealers were sitting in a eight story high uh, space where they could um, make their money. Um, and the, the other thing about this particular building um, that I think was um, somewhat innovative was, again, it, it had a double skin system. Um, and the, uh, all the air conditioning ducting and so on actually passed through that double skin. You can't actually see it um, on the elevation here, but uh, if, you, if you looked at this straight on on a, on a nice clear day, you would actually see the ducts uh, running across the building. Um, and what that permitted us to do is to uh, not have any suspended ceilings. The, um, uh, there was a concrete um, coffered slab was the exposed structure and all the air was then uh, distributed uh, through the floor um, and um, allowed the, 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 the concrete ceiling above to provide enough thermal mass to uh, again temper the fluctuations of temperature in the building. Um, it was also a hybrid construction in the sense that um, unlike what people typically do, they build a core out of concrete and then they'll build a steel frame around it. We did it the other way around. We built our, um, our cores, which are on the uh, four corners of the building. There's a separate core in each one. That was built out of steel and the frame was built out of concrete. And uh, the reason why we did that was that we were able to prefabricate all of the services that went into the building. Um, so that was on a floor by floor basis. And in fact, the entire uh, servicing arrangement was erected over two weekends. 
uh, for the entire building. That everything had been prefabricated, the lift shafts, the vertical rise, everything. And so uh, basically we used material as was appropriate for construction. Okay, so now we're moving on to a different genre of building, uh, what I call the independent envelope. Um, similar to what we saw with the Stockley Park building, with a building within a building, um, this has a separate enclosure uh, with uh, a number of very large um, halls within it. It's a, it's a large um, music center. There's a big uh, concert hall, a practice hall, a chamber hall, and there's also a music school in the building. And, uh, and basically the three uh, central buildings are tucked behind these sort of larger volumetric spaces. Um, and you can see here a, a very large um, sort of open space. Again, tempered, tempered air in there um, so that, you know, if you go in there on a cold day, um, you're not going to be completely warm, you're still going to be wearing your coat, um, but not as cold as it is outside and not as warm as it's going to be uh, when, you're, when you're inside the concert. Um, I think one of the innovations here, um, and this is the bit that I prim primarily was involved in, was the outer in enclosure skin, in that we were able to construct a, a geometrically, apparently complex form. Um, and uh, this was uh, around about 2000, 2001 that this was built. So just at about the time when um, organic forms and so on were beginning to become fashionable. Um, and we, uh, we strategized the construction and the geometries so that we were able to get a fair amount of repetition through extruding certain profiles um, in such a way that uh, we got a lot of um, a repetition of scale. And, and so the, the, the structure on this cost no much more than, say, a, a sort of big box uh, type of construction. And then um, another one here where, again, a sort of hybrid of um, using fabric structures uh, as a way to um, bring light into a building. This is an extension to a cafeteria um, in a uh, college setting. Um, it was an existing building, uh, which was this uh, part of the back here uh, going down vertically. And then we extended it out here. They needed more seating space for the, uh, for the cafeteria. And, and so by putting in this um, very lightweight roof, um, a lot of light was transmitted through that space. And actually, this is north facing. And in fact, there was a lot of reflected light back into the upper, into the upper spaces as well. Um, so again, um, a somewhat unusual use of materials and uh, mater uh, structural type to, to solve a, a quite a different problem. And then uh, more recently, um, over in Flint, uh, working with Frederick Fisher. Um, this was an extension and a renovation to the existing uh, building. And, um, and I think what was innovative about this was um, uh, just a very light construction, um, a, a light intervention into uh, what is a, a fairly solid um, sort of 60s building. Um, and, and again, taking advantage of a lot of natural light into the space, uh, wherever possible in the public spaces. And again, um, reuse of some of the facilities that we had there. Uh, one of the things we did was there was a, uh, an existing sort of auditorium that was uh, they were they, sort of a multi-purpose space. It was just a flat floor, and they would have banquets there, and they would have talks there, and a raised stage, and uh, all kinds of you know multi-use facilities. And it was never really sat satisfactory. So they wanted to convert this into um, an auditorium like this. So what we proposed was. Um, to, to use a underfloor ventilation system and feed the air in from the base. And that would have meant um, a lot of upheaval on the existing structure in terms of putting um, a whole new uh, AC system in. Um, but in fact, what we were able to do was uh, all the diffusers um, became um, uh, outlet positions and then we fed uh, the existing ducting that was in the system back into the floor system. And so we actually saved tremendous amount of cost on the service installation by reusing the ductwork and reversing the flow of the whole system. <coughs> and then on a, on a much smaller scale, a little fun project we did um, when the College of Architecture at uh, University of Michigan had its uh, centennial celebration. Um, the, we had uh, 
uh, a few objects that were donated to the college, which is the top part of this column and the bottom part, uh, donated back at the time of launch. Um, uh, and and it, was, it was basically uh, sitting on the lawn on central campus. And our dean at the time uh, thought, well, why don't we uh, bring this to the new college, which it had now moved to North Campus, and, um, and somehow celebrate that as a, as a kind of memorial to, to the college. And so uh, had a few brainstorming sessions and we decided that we wanted to try and reinstate the scale of this column um, to classical proportions and also to have some kind of modern interpretation of that. So uh, hence this kind of Nician uh, intervention uh, which is holding up the capital up in the air. And um, it, it's, it's really interesting. You, you experience this in different ways, uh, different uh, times of the day, different you know, when it snows. Uh, during the fall, um, it, it always seems to have a, a, a whole different life of its own. When you walk around it, proportionally the d directions change. So it's not, it, it doesn't have that symmetry that you would find in a, in a classical column uh, because of the configuration of the, um, uh, of the cruciform in the center. Um, and uh, and it, it, it has got a, a remarkable sort of lightweight feel about it, but at the same time it's still quite solid. So it has all these kind of ambiguities in it that um, make a lot of fun and, and, um, and again the sort of innovations here were um, you know kind of hybridization of materials using the best of what's modern with um, combination of what is old um, and um, the whole thing is pre-stressed together to get the continuity between the steel and the, um, and the stone. Okay so uh, moving on to um, more of the academic side of things now, the research through making, I've called it. Um, and uh, these are, I'm just gonna show you a few projects that I've worked on with um, students in various capacities, either um, ind independent studies, some of them were part of a studio, some of them were part of a uh, seminar that I teach, uh, some of them were um, funded research projects where I employed students um, to work on a specific task. So there's a, a little bit of, of everything there um, in terms of what these projects uh, represent. So this, uh, this is a framework system that, um, that I invented um, uh, after working with uh, Peter Lynch, who used to be the head of architecture at, at Cranbrook. And uh, we, work, we did a lot of work together on what were called, or what are called reciprocal frames. Um, if, if you don't know what a reciprocal frame is, you know that little trick where you take um, three or four knives and you interlace them and you try and uh, get them to balance on the top of a bottle and then they all kind of hold themselves together without falling down. Uh, that's the principle of a, of, a of a reciprocal frame where all the interlocking at the node uh, basically provides the structural stability. Um, so we were doing a lot of work with that in bamboo and so on and, and then I started morphing this to more of a rectilinear form and began to discover that um, using that reciprocal frame connectivity with uh, concepts of tensegrity systems that um, I ended up with a kind of three-layered woven system, uh, which, is what, which is what this is. Um, so um, what you see here is uh, three contiguous strut systems uh, connected each to their own, but uh, each one of the three is independent of the other. So they, uh, one of the woven systems is only connected to the other through uh, cables like this, so that they're actually not in contact with each other. So in fact, what you're looking at here, if you imagine there's one, two, three uh, struts here, um, at no point does the one that this connects to as a woven system within that connect to any of those in, in a direct compression fashion. Um, so this was um, something that I thought might uh, begin to resolve the problems of tensegrity, which is that they are incredibly flexible structures, they're nonlinear, and um, haven't really caught on as, as something that people want to build because they're just not economic enough and, and just don't function very well. Uh, but because of this con uh, contiguous strut woven system, um, a lot of more stiffness was built into the, into the equation and we've actually proven that this could become a very viable um, construction system and also very deployable. Uh, all you need is a few bits of bamboo and a couple of reels of cable and you can put the thing together. Um, this was also uh, some other studies that uh, we, we carried out on um, 
shell type surfaces working with different materials. Um, and here you can see these are um, you know, just simply working with cardboard, chipboard, um, connecting them in certain ways. Um, in fact, the, the, the one on the bottom right here is um, really a primary work of uh, Peter Lynch and, and we collaborated on this for uh, an installation in Cranbrook for um, uh, the Detroit Symphony, which uh, unfortunately was an unbuilt project. Um, but as you'll see in a minute, uh, the, the, the positive outcome from that was that we won a, a national award for, um, for the uh, PA awards. Um, but we, we, we did a lot of, a lot of studies in um, how you can connect um, uh, materials together that have the capability to flex and move in such a way that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so a lot of the studies we did, uh, these are computer simulations in um, uh, ANSYS um, stress analysis software, which also has a nonlinear uh, capability within it, um, looking at uh, different types of cellular arrangements and the type of curvatures that you can get out of, out of warping these surfaces. Uh, such that uh, what you're getting here, you know, these are two directions of, of, of uh, bending, uh, which are opposite each other, otherwise known as uh, anticlastic curvature. Um, and so you could begin to imagine that you could create sort of hyperbolic paraboloid forms um, from what effectively would be a, a planar construction, and simply by twisting the material could warp this into, into new forms. Um, and here you can see some examples of that, uh, just literally starting from a flat plane um, and then uh, depending on the configuration of the lattice, um, the order of them, the size, uh, the stiffness, uh, will actually begin to inform how, how those geometries begin to uh, emerge and evolve from that. Um, sort of sticking with looking at the sort of panelized approach. Uh, we also started doing some research in composite floor systems uh, and window systems. And, and again, this was looking at different types of geometries and um, uh, in terms of their cellular construction and also in terms of um, uh, how, how that, that module would then be repopulated. So um, you can see here there's a mixture of materials. This is uh, this is uh, a purely glass. Uh, the whole thing is glass laminated together. Um, this is a combination of glass and carbon fiber. Uh, here we have glass fiber with um, polycarbonate. And then here we have a mixture of polycarbonate, uh, aluminum, and wood um, uh, as a sort of a study that we did in, in one of the seminars that I teach uh, to explore different types of structural principles and, and understand more about how the materials would behave uh, uh, with these different configurations. Um, and then subsequent to that, uh, we then started to imagine, uh, this was outside of the seminar context, taking this back into further research, uh, looking at how this concept of a composite sandwich could be extended into um, window facade systems. And, and that's what's really grown into the product that, um, that I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, a little bit later. So this was a, a design build project, studio project, uh, which we did in uh, one semester um, with, uh, I think there was something like 12 students in the, in the studio. And um, <coughs> it, uh, it's, a, it's a band shell that's located in the Arboretum in, in Ann Arbor. And uh, the sort of underlying principle of this was again kind of springboarding from some of that earlier research I was talking about um, with uh, warping surfaces and seeing how you can begin to lock that shape into place um, once you've got, got it into that shape. Uh, we started working with uh, profile decking um, as the sort of underlying structure and um, did some experiments warping that to see how far we could bend it and twist it before it buckled and to what extent we could then get it to curve into some kind of hyperbolic form. So, so these were some of the early prototyping studies we did uh, to explore the combination of um, some kind of wood decking that would work in hybrid uh, connectivity with, uh, with the metal decking. Um, <coughs> so we ended up uh, convincing ourselves we could do it. Uh, so we ended up with uh, two, 
two layers of metal deck which were running at uh, orthogonal axes to each other, uh, which are then um, compositely connected together. Uh, this is um, plywood uh, connected both top and bottom, um, and that forms the, the finish on the, on the deck, and that was all uh, CNC cut um, on developed surfaces so that we could warp these uh, into this plane to give us that hyperbolic form that you saw, saw on, the first, on the first image. <coughs> and then uh, subsequent to having constructed this, the, uh, the next thing we discovered in the winter was that the surface was beginning to suffer, so we, we, we needed to protect it, and so we went off and, um, and it was really just uh, my PhD student and I worked on this together uh, to develop a fabric system that we could then uh, tautly uh, stretch over the over the, the shell, which would then protect the the surface in winter. Okay, so moving on to the Cranbrook project that I talked about earlier on. Um, so, if you imagine a seventy-piece orchestra uh, sitting in here in the gardens uh, on the peristyle, Cranbrook, uh, that was what that was intended for. <coughs> As I say. Um, we uh, unfortunately didn't get to build this because the client uh, who was going to put up the money for this decided to put it into other parts of the, uh, of the college. And, uh, and so we were, we were left with the design but no, no build. Um, but, you know, a lot of studies went into this. Uh, we, you know, we worked in clay. We worked in fabric. Um, these are all just models that we made and then moved into digital space. Um, simulated these forms uh, using form finding software uh, to eventually conceive of the entire project. And these are just some of the form finding studies that I did um, to uh, derive the mathematical description of the surface uh, and where we could also then do uh, CFD analysis on defining what sort of wind pressures would occur on the, st on the structure um, uh, in order to do the, the complete analysis. Okay, so talking about integrated design, um, <coughs> this is a uh, competition project that I worked on with uh, Robert Klein, who used to live here in Detroit, now is in Vancouver. Um, and in fact, we, uh, we worked on this remotely. He was in Vancouver, I was here, and we were shipping stuff to and fro. Uh, we'd, we'd done quite a lot of competitions together, so we had a, a pretty good shorthand and a good way to communicate. And again, another one of these wonders of digital technology where you don't actually have to be sitting with someone in the same office to uh, conceive and pull off uh, an entire design. Um, and a little bit more difficult if you don't know the person, but the fact that we had a working relationship and we kind of knew how, how each other th uh, thinks, uh, we were able to pull this together fairly quickly. And this again is the sort of concept of a building within a building. Uh, we had this outer envelope which had again these sort of warped surfaces, again, coming from some of that early work that I'd done in research, um, and, and some of the stuff that I borrowed from uh, my experiences in, in practice with um, a, a sort of a double envelope type of building. And this was a, a sustainable center in, um, uh, for Calumet near Chicago. Um, taking some of that research further, um, in 2005, we entered the uh, Solar Decathlon and one of the uh, sort of underlying principles that we uh, firmly stuck with was to, to develop a construction um, almost outside of what the competition meant. We, you know, we really saw this as a great research opportunity to begin to explore envelope and, and what we could do with that. Um, and, and so we uh, looked very much at this kind of modular prefabricated approach uh, where each of the um, housing units were made, were made out of an eight foot wide unit uh, that fitted on the back of a, a trailer. Uh, so in fact, the trailer and the, the building became one. They were inseparable. And in fact, they still are inseparable. We have the building uh, now housed in the Botanical Gardens in, um, in Ann Arbor. And uh, we have uh, various covers along the bottom that um, uh, sort of close off the, the, the base of the building. But uh, underneath that are still all the wheels um, attached to the building. So again, another kind of interpretation on you know, how you can integrate uh, the means of transportation with um, your manufacturing process and the, the final realization of the project. And then just some uh, interior shots of the, 
completed uh, artifact. Uh, this is now open, um, uh, it, well, it's generally open during the summer. Uh, we close it during the winter just because of uh, practical reasons, but it's, it's open in the summer for, for public viewing, so if anybody's in our at that time, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, typically it's open um, in the afternoons for viewing. Okay, um, so the, the other uh, thing I wanted to highlight here, this is uh, based on a research project that um, I did with uh, NSF funding uh, for a modular prefabricated housing system, um, particularly uh, uh, targeting affordable housing. Um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of work has gone into this. It's been a three-year research program where we looked at the context for modular prefabrication uh, to the point of uh, conceiving of a building system to then conceiving of, well, how would this be manufactured as though it were uh, part of an industrialized process, so uh, as you would uh, build uh, automobiles. Um, so the integrated part of this is the um, combination of both the fabric construction and also all the servicing components. So the, uh, the heating cooling system, um, which is built into the fabric, it's part of the modular construction. So if you think of your car and the, um, you know, the dash panel in front of you, it's got integrated with it all the wiring, uh, all the air conditioning parts. Um, that all gets pre-made as a modular system. It gets plugged into the chassis of the car and everything is kind of uh, connected in that way. So that, that's really how, how this thing comes about, that the, uh, when you put this building together, it's already gonna have uh, things like the, uh, these are chill ceilings, um, which, which uh, basically provides the, the summer cooling. Uh, we have hydronic um, heating panels that are built into the walls. Uh, there's an underfloor cavity uh, air system here as well and then all the services and risers are built uh, into the wall. So it's all part of an integral uh, system. It's, it's a kind of a monocoque uh, construction. And there you can see some um, digital versions of, of the construction, um, all the components <coughs> coming together, and then all of the ducting and so on, um, which is integrated into the skin. Okay, so holistic and sustainable design. Um, You've probably all heard this before and there are various uh, versions of it, uh, but typically something like somewhere between 40 and 50% of all energy consumed is through buildings. Um, so buildings are, are a big player in the sustainability world and unfortunately um, there's not a lot of uh, research and development money going into this. Um, people seem to be more interested in trying to make uh, automobiles more efficient, um, battery technologies, renewables, and so on, um, with, with not an awful lot of emphasis in buildings. But I think it's beginning to change. The, the whole sea change is now beginning to happen, uh, particularly on, you know, with the onset of the um, architecture uh, 2030 uh, imperative or initiative. Um, I think that's created a lot of awareness as well. Um, LEED has also had a lot of role to play in this, um, but um, there are issues with LEED, which I won't go into now. Um, but really, if you think about energy uh, as the driving force, which is really what it ought to be, um, because if you consider the energy consumption of a building on a life cycle basis, um, and, and we do a lot of this sort of thing, life cycle analysis, where you're looking at the uh, evolution of a product or building from cradle to grave. Um, and so, basically, you're looking at material processing, the uh, production of the materials, the construction, the energy in use, and its end use. So this is all the embodied energy, this is all the use energy, and then what happens when you um, dispose of the materials. And so if you add up all that energy together, you get the total life cycle energy for the system. And um, the outputs from that are gonna be things like uh, emissions, um, uh, toxic particles, and so on and how do you make an assessment for minimizing that total approach. Uh, we did this for um, a competition we entered with the EPA uh, called the P3 Awards. And um, again, this was linking the uh, window system to this, this research um, and uh, where we were considering biocomposite materials as one of the primary materials for construction. 
Um, and we conducted a number of life cycle analyses on that to, to demonstrate uh, some of the superior sustainability characteristics um, of, of, of the product. So again, you can see the, um, the sort of primary stages here um, that one would go through, and then you go into much more detailed analysis in terms of you know, what are the components that add to, uh, for example, the material processing. So there you can see um, pulping, sawing, chemical um, mixing, mechanical pulping, and so on, um, cardboard manufacturing in the next phase, and so on. So <coughs> all of the energy uh, con contributors have to be added up in each of these phases to give you the final uh, energy equation. Um, so these are just a few snapshots of some of the presentations for this to the EPA. Um, we were demonstrating that the window system could save about 25% energy um, in its performance, um, as well as have these very significant material life cycle uh, advantages using these highly sustainable materials. Um, these are, uh, the material that we've particularly focused on is a material called canaf. It's grown down in Texas in great abundant quantities. Um, it's a very strong fiber and uh, we integrated that into the product as a composite, uh, composite material um, that then formed the core of the, of the window system. Um, and this is just a snapshot of some of the research activities we carried out that was associated with this. Uh, a lot of uh, solar testing, uh, thermal chamber testing, uh, materials testing, um, and then also looking at lots of different types of configuration and the manufacturing approaches towards, uh, towards making those. So it was a, a, a for the window, um, and it's on the basis of this that we've now um, gone into a, a tech transfer mode and um, are actually beginning to uh, commercialize this as a product. And uh, similarly with the, um, the housing system, uh, we've got this to a stage now where um, having gone through all the motions of understanding its fabrication, construction, its context, uh, the demographics, the type of modular systems that we could apply to, that there is a kind of systematic approach to how these buildings could be uh, moved into the marketplace. And these are some of the uh, sort of integrated um, energy strategies, just a few snapshots of um, some of those diagrams, um, which again tries to capitalize on, on passive strategies. So use uh, natural ventilation where possible, introduce a bit of comfort heating, cooling as, as required, but uh, again, try and use uh, solar gains and uh, natural ventilation to heat and cool the building whenever possible. And um, through this process, we've done a lot of simulation work, uh, CFD analysis, this is a thermal flu concept that we've integrated into the, into the building concept. Um, uh, lighting studies, daylighting, uh, energy analysis, and also dynamic um, energy system analysis. <coughs> and added to that, we've also um, looked at this from a life cycle perspective. Um, in fact, we were commissioned to do a study to compare prefabricated construction with uh, on-site stick construction. And uh, so we, you know, we developed a standard module to do the study on, uh, developed all the different components that would then feed into the system, uh, determined what all the life cycle uh, parameters were in terms of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, um, various other uh, toxic emissions and so on, uh, and, and also the, the, the energy consumption comparison um, between the two. Okay, so leveraging industrial technology, um, I've always looked at how we can use industry as a means by which to inform us in our manufacturing and uh, construction concepts. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we were looking at the auto industry um, as a way of thinking about how buildings might be constructed. So the, you know, the ideal model is this um, component that runs through the industrial process with uh, robotics and so on, um, pushing out these units uh, at the other end. Um, and we've done uh, extensive studies um, where you, know, you develop up all your components and then you, you look at different uh, methodologies for connecting these all together in the factory. And, uh, and we can study those to, to optimize on the whole um, uh, industrialized process. And that's again working in collaboration with our uh, colleagues in the uh, mechanical engineering um, manufacturing uh, department. 
And so this is what a typical um, production line flow line might look, li look, li look like with all these different nodes. Uh, each node is given an intelligence in terms of what it's processing, uh, what time it can take to, to process that particular uh, artifact, uh, what can go wrong with it, um, you know, how many people need to man it, um, and then you can also change it uh, by bringing in different, uh, different aspects. So what we were highlighting here was uh, for customized assembly, uh, you would have the main production line that would run through to the point where customization takes place, and then you might have a number of streams out here uh, that allows that customized uh, product to be to be um, completed at the at the end of the line, so that you don't have any delays and you still you can still offer customers uh, a lot of variation in the process. And this is a snapshot of the uh, software that we use to do that. Um, so you can see here each of these nodes has an intelligence to it, and uh, I haven't got it animated here, but you can actually see this thing process flow, and you can see them kind of stacking up when this line is slowed down and this one can't go any faster, you, know, you have to store things somewhere until this catches up and then you, you keep going again. So the software uh, works through that sort of real-time production flow and then as you go along with time, you can see this is the volume of output over time. So in the first few days and weeks, uh, you, you're down here at maybe 50% production rate and as you learn and get better, your production uh, rate uh, starts improving. And Again, you have to be very systematic in, in how you um, categorize what you're doing. And so, again, we built up uh, a complete modeling virtual space in terms of the identification of all the components. We linked this to the sort of standard um, building coding system so that, you know, ultimately uh, people are familiar with what those codes mean. Um, it's, it's, it's a coding that I've worked with in the past. I know it works really well and also works really well with a kind of industrialized approach to, to the whole thing. And we were doing the same thing with the uh, window system uh, technology, um, looking at how we can customize different configurations through the CNC produced um, manufacturing uh, approach. Okay, um, so I've, I've also done um, a bit of work outside of the boundaries of building uh, working here with a automobile um, sports car um, canopy system um, manufacturer um, who were, they were looking to find new ways to conceive of how these canopies might be um, uh, designed um, and also manufactured and patterned so that uh, they would be a tight fit. I mean, typically these things are made like um, a tailored suit. You know, you go off to a, sp a specialist tailor and they measure you up and you know, take all the dimensions and you go back again and they try it on and it doesn't quite fit and they make another change and go back. And maybe after the fourth visit, they kind of got it to, to fit your body. Uh, this is how they now, this is the technology they use in, in making these today. And what they wanted to do was to be able to, you know, conceive of this thing, make it, fit once, and end of story. So um, they, uh, they called on me to work with them on the form finding and the assessment of the fabric system to help them work with that. So this was a kind of reverse technology transfer from building to auto industry. Normally it's the, it's the other way around. Um, so we did a lot of simulation work, um, uh, testing, uh, in the lab testing, and uh, establish all the characteristics of the fabrics and um, fit up and so on, and then use those characteristics in the software, which then allowed us to um, come up with the, the correct um, cutting patterns for, for the final fabric. Um, and, and similarly with the, with the housing system now, we've had a lot of inquiries from people who are interested in uh, places like Peru and um, Brazil, um, looking at countries that have got huge housing crises, uh, people who've gone, who had disasters, um, need to be rehoused efficiently. Um, and so again, we're looking here at um, working with industry to try and um, make this system as automated as possible and so um, we've had some discussions with um, a stamping plant, you know, who make uh, panels for cars. And we found out that the biggest panels that they make, in fact, uh, fits very nicely with the standard module that we've got in the building. So we could actually make all our components out of stamp products. Um, we haven't really got anywhere with this yet. Um, we have to put together a commercialization strategy for this. 
but uh, discussions are ongoing and um, hopefully in the years to come we'll be able to move forward with something on that. Okay, so just to finalize and finish off here, um, as I say, the, uh, you know, we, we just to kind of wrap up on, on the theme of the boundaries and um, research through making and um, how research can convert to practice. So um, these are two areas that I'm focusing on at the moment is how we can eventually commercialize this building system for uh, modular housing. And we've done uh, a number of studies on different sites in different cities, um, looking at these different configurations and coming up with you know, variations of building where no one building looks like the other. And we think that's the, you know, the key important uh, driver of this is that the, the system shouldn't look like it's the same building wherever you put it. Every building should look different. Um, I mean, they can look the same, but they don't always have to look the same. Um, so we've been doing a lot of uh, um, rendering and, um, you know, presentation materials to, to demonstrate how these differences uh, can be expressed and, um, and the sort of lifestyle opportunities that exist for high quality living, particularly for, um, you know, affordable, affordable type conditions. And, and this particular system, um, it's like a, a kind of jigsaw puzzle block. Uh, which r literally just slips together with some standard modules and then you can compose those into, you know, uh, really an infinite number of permutations uh, to give you very different types of um, facade characteristics, building characteristics, um, and, and also the way the, the demographics of the building work uh, uh, internally. Uh, the whole thing can be modeled around this very simple, what I call the, the basic brick building block. It happens to be a very large brick. And uh, just some final shots of, of that as a final scheme. And then the same thing with the window system. Um, you know, we've decided to go big on this to look at large commercial buildings for this application because that's really what it's suited for because of its superior structural characteristics and also its, its very high energy uh, benefits. And then also taking advantage of the customization that can be made out of um, the CNC methodology that we've developed. Uh, we've actually designed and built our own uh, CNC machines to, to, to run the system. And um, again, um, uh, showing how the, uh, the whole system works as a kind of multifunctional system, um, taking advantage of the way the light goes through the, the uh, product, the uh, shading effects, and also the uh, solar transmission. And more recently now, we've also looked at integrating um, energy production within the multifunctional window system. Um, on the commercialization side, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you've produced a product and you want to go out and sell it, you have to know what your market is. So uh, here we've, uh, we've done a lot of work with the business school to establish uh, how we can market this as a product. So uh, our strategy here was to look at niche markets, um, such as offices with a specific subset of that on the right-hand side multi-purpose retail, lodging, exclusive retail, commercial, recreational, educational, public recreational, um, as the niche markets that we would approach uh, in that process. And then the, um, so that was the first generation that we developed and in this last year, um, we, we uh, managed to win another grant and we're collaborating with a university in China and various other industry collaborators, uh, which has taken us to the second generation of product. And in this particular one, we've really flung everything at it um, so we are actually aiming for a net zero energy facade. There will be no energy lost or gained through this, through this facade uh, on an annual basis. So it has a multifunctional configuration. Um, it has uh, lighting integrated within it, solar energy, uh, energy storage, and also has a thermal vacuum, which makes it, so which it makes it that, that efficient. And, um, and the, these two pictures side by side, this is the same product, this is at night when the lights come on in the windows and in the daytime you can actually see through it, uh, all invisible and uh, producing a lot of energy. And with that, I thank you for your attendance. It's time for a few questions before we get to our reception. In the back there, Mark.
It was originally geared for larger projects because we wanted to set the bar really high so that we felt if we solved the big problem, uh, the smaller problems would be really easy to solve. Um, but having said that, we haven't really targeted the housing market. But I think this next second generation system that we're talking about, where you can literally buy a window and put it in your house and it's all singing, all dancing, definitely the uh, housing market is, is a big target there. Yeah. Yeah. In the back, yeah. If I tell you, I'm going to have to shoot you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> what, what, what would you like to know that I don't have to give away all my trade secrets? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we do actually have a patent out on the first generation system. Uh, it's a uh, manufacturing patent, so that's on the actual process of making it. You know, you all play it really tough there at, uh, at Michigan. You're the first speaker here that's ever threatened to shoot one of our faculty members. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Canab. K-E-N-A-F. Okay, anything else? <coughs> Okay, very good. Harry, thank you so much for helping us kick off uh, our thank big you, week. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. And um, please, everyone, uh, go to the reception, and I'm sure there'll be uh, time for some casual conversation. Thanks all for coming.